Last month, I received a humbling letter from a Cubs radio listener who wanted me to wish his dad a happy Father's Day. Dear Mr. Hughes, my dad is a lifelong Cubs fan and he raised his four sons to be as well. He used to record your broadcast on a cassette tape for us to fall asleep to. <laughs> as a broadcaster, generally it's bad for ratings when part of your audience is snoozing. But thank you to Jane Forbes Clark and the entire staff here at the Hall of Fame. Thanks to Tom Ricketts and the Chicago Cubs organization for all of your support in being here. And congratulations to the other honorees this weekend. John Lowe is a brilliant baseball writer and a longtime friend. To Carl Erskine for his Buck O'Neill Lifetime Achievement Award. And to the newest Hall of Fame ball players, the true stars of this weekend, Fred McGriff and Scott Rowland. It is my extreme pleasure to be with you today in this magical baseball village. I am delighted, proud, and excited, but mainly I am grateful because while the Ford C. Frick Award is a cherished and coveted individual honor, there is simply no way I ever could have gotten here by myself. My family is here. My sweet wife of 36 years, Trish, is the be very best friend I have ever had in my life, and a tremendous mother to our two daughters, Janelle and Amber. I love all three of you very much. Amber came all the way in from Colorado on a red eye, so thanks, sweetie, for being here. I really wish my parents were still alive. Virgil and Mary Margaret, they were kind and gentle. Both were educators. Mom was an elementary school teacher. Dad was a college professor. They stressed reading and learning and getting good grades in school, but they also encouraged athletic competition as well. My older brother John is another person who is no longer with us. He had a very, very difficult life. But in college at San Jose State University, John, more than anyone else, got me started in broadcasting. My younger brother Chuck is here all the way from San Jose. I love you, brother. And members of my wife's family are in attendance, brothers Roger and Marvin Anderson and their families. Thanks to all of you for being here. Receiving the call from the hall was one of life's best ever experiences. So sublime, it's almost incomprehensible. Baseball Hall of Fame President Josh Rowich called me last December. I was at home with Trish, also in my living room were my great partner on Cubs Radio, Ron Coomer, Odyssey Chicago Broadcasting Executives, Rachel Williamson and Mitch Rosen, and the Chicago Cubs President of Business Operations, Crane Kenny. Crane was thoughtful enough to hire a video crew to record the moment for posterity. The phone rang and Josh Rowich says, Pat, congratulations on being named the Ford C. Frick Award winner for 2023. He said more, but I did not hear another word. <laughs> My head started spinning with joy and emotion, and I truly wish that every baseball announcer could experience that thrill. Within a moment or two, I see a text phone, a text message on the phone from the great Bob Costas. Congrats, Pat, richly deserved, Welcome to the club, and the C in the word club was capitalized, as well it should be. I have loved baseball forever. Like millions of kids all over the world, I dreamed of being a big league ball player someday. I did experience the childhood euphoria of playing on multiple championship teams. I was a decent athlete, but never great. And at about the age of 17, I realized playing pro ball was not going to happen for me. But still, I wanted to make a living somehow in sports. That was my passion, professional sports in particular. Maybe coaching, possibly umpiring, or refereeing, two things I did to help put myself through college, by the way. And my older brother, John, was taking broadcasting classes and dabbling in play-by-play, -play, and he encouraged me to do the same. My play-by-play -play had a very unusual beginning. At the end of my modest athletic career, I'm playing college basketball, or more accurately, sitting on the bench most of the time. 
One game, out of sheer boredom, I just started doing play-by-play -play of my own team during the game. Youngie, pull up, foul line jumper, good again. He's got 10, Spartans by six. And then I stopped, I didn't want to be annoying. And one of my teammates said, Pat, you're not that bad, keep that going. So you could say that in my play-by-play -play career, the first listening audience consisted of the other bench warmers on my college team. Sort of an inglorious beginning. But then I really did make a dedicated commitment to play-by-play -play announcing. On the campus radio station KSJS, I called every game I could. Football, basketball, baseball, interview shows, sports wrap-ups. Then I would listen to my own tapes, critiquing myself harshly, eliminating forever things I didn't like hearing, and developing things that sounded okay. And then I began listening with a different ear to established professional announcers trying to gain, to gain insights and ideas. And I've been favorably influenced and inspired by many of my broadcasting predecessors, including, among others, Russ Hodges, Lon Simmons, and Bill King, the Bay Area voices of my childhood. John Facenda, the masterful narrator of NFL films. Vin Scully, Al Michaels, and Marty Brenneman. Bob Costas, Harry Carey, and John Miller. Bob Euchre, and Al McGuire. McGuire, by the way, also taught me how to hitchhike. As I was climbing the sportscasting ladder, I was hired by and worked for some great people, including, among others, in 1979, Jim Reisinger in San Jose, California. 1981, John Petrie in Columbus, Ohio. 1983, Billy Robertson, Vice President, Minnesota Twins. And 1984, Bill Haig, Milwaukee Brewers VP. All of them treated me with friendship and respect. In Milwaukee, I was a radio partner with Bob Euchre for 12 seasons. Last December, when I got the call from Cooperstown, Bob was among the first to text me congratulations. I called him right back. I said, Bob, I am sure I learned more baseball from you than any other person. He replied, I probably should have learned the game myself before I tried teaching it to you. <laughs> Thanks to Bob and to Bud Selig, who was the Brewers' owner for most of the time I was in Milwaukee. In the autumn of 1995, I was chosen to be the new radio play-by-play -play man for the Chicago Cubs. A big transition, going from small market Milwaukee to major market Chicago. My new partner would be Cubs legend, Ron Santo. Ronnie would become, a, would become a very important person in my life. Thoughtfully, he called me the night before our first Cactus League broadcast. He said, Pat, I know you're nervous, don't be. You do the play-by-play, -play, you're gonna be fine. I'll do the color, we're gonna have fun, okay? I'll see you tomorrow. As he spoke those words, it might sound corny, but I could literally feel the tension leave my body. I felt very relaxed and ready to go to work the next day on Cubs radio. And the next day, in the very first half inning, Ron Santo and I clicked immediately. After the third out, he stands up smiling and shakes my hand. And the look on his face said, oh boy, this is gonna be great. And I thought, man, if he gets this excited over a Cactus League game, wait until we get into a pennant race. But it was a special time, and Ronnie and I shared a unique chemistry that became known as the Pat and Ron Show. We spent 15 years together, did plenty of laughing. And around Ronnie, that was not a big deal because he was one of the funniest people I have ever known just by being himself. He could be variously a backseat driver, a fashion cop, a food cop, and a championship chop buster. Now, I never knew Ron Santa wore a toupee, a hairpiece, until one night I found out. Cubs are playing the Mets at old Shea Stadium in New York, a cold April evening. In the visiting radio booth, right above our heads was this old-fashioned electric heater, the kind that glowed a bright orange when you turned it on. Ronnie and I stand for the national anthem. Halfway through the song, I smell something burning. <laughs> then I hear something sizzling like bacon on a stove. Zzz. Then I hear Santo say, shoot. I turn to look at him. Ron Santo's hairpiece is on fire. <laughs> 
A blue flame is shooting out the top of his head. Smoke is everywhere. I didn't panic. I kept my cool, sort of. I took a glass of water and splashed it on his head. And then he said, shoot a few more times. Now, Ron Santo was a handsome man, but also kind of vain about his appearance. His first thought was, how does it look? I lied. I said, it doesn't look that bad to me. It actually looked like a golfer. Maybe Phil Mickelson had taken a pitching wedge and whacked one right off the top of his noggin. There was a divot in the top of Santo's head. How does it look? We both thought it was very fitting that the name of the Mets starting pitcher that night was Al Leiter. <laughs> but Ronnie and Harry Carey both went out of their way to welcome me to Chicago way back when, and I will forever be grateful. Harry also gave me some good practical advice about our profession. He said, Pat, when you become a baseball announcer, you don't just sign up for the winning games and the exciting seasons, you sign up for everything. Pretty good advice. After the 2013 season, Ron Coomer joined me on Cubs Radio. I'd say I've been pretty lucky with guys named Ron as announcing partners. The 10 years with Ron Coomer have been wonderful. He is simply one of the best people I've ever known in my life. A total team player, a Chicago native, lifelong Cubs fan. He played for the Cubs. He's insightful. He's smart. He's funny. He explains the game in a way that is easy for the audience to understand. Great sense of humor. And by the way, we got to cover a world championship season for the Cubs together. As long as I'm doing radio play-by-play -play for the Cubs, I want to have Ron Coomer right next to me. A thank you to all the other people I've worked with and shared a microphone with over the years. Currently, the talented Zach Zaidman is the third man in our Cubs radio booth. Zach is a joy to work with. Other third men on Cubs radio have included Andy Mazur, Corey Provis, now a prominent announcer with the Minnesota Twins, Judd Surratt, the radio play-by-play -play, uh, man of the NHL Boston Bruins, and Mark Brody. And I've also enjoyed many on-the-air moments with guys like Bruce Levine and Len Casper, among others. I've worked with some of the best engineers in the country and production people, including Kent Sommerfeld in Milwaukee, and in Chicago, Matt Boltz, Dave Miska, and Paul Zerang, and on the production side, Todd Manley and Stephen Leventhal. Thanks to all of you. In Chicago, we work for great people. Team owners Tom Ricketts and siblings Laura, Todd, and Pete, they want the Cubs to win as passionately as the ballplayers do. And they give us total freedom as broadcasters to just do our thing. Thanks to the Ricketts family. And a very special thank you to Crane Kenny, the Cubs president of business operations. Crane had everything to do with putting me in the Cubs Hall of Fame last year, and he was certainly instrumental in the events that led to me being in Cooperstown here today. Crane, thank you for everything. I'd like to also acknowledge the Marquee Sports Network and their leadership team of Mike McCarthy and Mike Santini. They've been magnanimous enough to include me in some of their programming over the years. Thanks to Mike and Mike. And in 41 years of big league baseball play-by-play, -play, I've worked with dozens of programming directors and station management types. The current executive producer of Cubs Radio, Mitch Rosen, is simply the best I have ever worked with. Thank you, Mitch. And in closing, I have a note to Cubs fans. If I was writing you a letter, it might read, what an extraordinary group of people you are. I want to thank you so much for your unbelievable passion for the ball club and your support of me. When I got the call from Cooperstown last December, I, I truly think there were some Cub fans who were just as happy as I was with the news. You make me feel like I am a part of your family. You invite me to special events like graduations, bar mitzvahs, and birthdays. And I absolutely love those games at Wrigley Field, those close ball games where you fans are not just part of the ballpark atmosphere, you become part of the ball game itself, and you play a significant role in a dramatic Cubs victory. That happens four to five times minimum every single season. As a broadcaster, I feed off of your energy. Let me just say, it has been my extreme privilege to be one of your announcers 
for these past three decades. And before my career ends, I hope I get at least one more chance to say something like, the Chicago Cubs win the World Series. Thank you.